Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. We've been making cheese in Wisconsin since before we were even a state, which may be one reason why we win so many awards for it. It's what happens when a whole state dreams in cheese. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Culture and Flavor is a podcast about food and culture centered in Black and Indigenous food ways. Hosted by myself, Zella Palmer, right here in New Orleans, Louisiana. Each episode features high vibrational conversations with cultural bearers, chefs, farmers, scholars, barbecue pit masters, and more. Where there is flavor, there is history. Join me on Culture and Flavor and all of my guests as we share stories that will have you praise dancing, cooking, conjuring, and inspiring your culinary journey. Y'all, I am so excited for this episode of Culture and Flavor with Lino Asana, a dear friend of mine. He is a filmmaker currently living in New Orleans from the Cameroon. His films often explore and celebrate themes of Black dynamism, identity, and transnationalism. Some of his films and videos have been featured by OK Africa, Bitter Southerner, Nowness, and Indie Wire, and screened at several film festivals. In addition to developing his first feature film, The Parking Lot Attendant. Asana is currently in post-production on a documentary that intimately explores the contribution of Black chefs and humble cooks in the New Orleans food industry. Welcome, Lino, to Culture and Flavor. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. First, I want to get started with just, you know, just a little bit about you. I know I explained, you know, a little bit about your bio, but I really want to get into depth of what made Mm -hmm. you come to New Orleans and just your recent trip to the Cameroon after so many years. Oh, man. Um, Well, I think uh, much of my work has always been about... um, finding connections in on um, in unfamiliar places and finding um, because I like to identify myself yes as a filmmaker but also like his version of uh, a palm wine story drinker which is kind of yeah which is kind of like this person that I was raised with that sits in this corner bars you know, in Cameroon and listens and talks and gossips and and speaks, in, you know, and uh, tells stories throughout the day. And um, so some parts of that and some part of, again, finding connections leans into always, you know, paying attention to little things that come my way. And one of that was when I first discovered the book Creole Feast by Rudy Lombard and Nathaniel Burton Mm -hmm. I was just immediately connected you know I really I really just connected with the book in that it 
it was exploring some connections and some ideas of things that I had experienced in my visits and visit in New Orleans, but I couldn't quite put my finger on. And mm-hmm. he goes into depth about, about that. And, you know, so that was one of, that was like the genesis of, you know, uh, that led me down the rabbit hole and into the place now that I call home. And uh, it's been great. It's been great ever since. So let me just give a little bit of context about uh, Creole Feast for our listeners who don't necessarily know about that cookbook. I mean, it is a classic um, treasure mm-hmm. cookbook in Black food ways, in American food ways, really. And it was uh, written and published mm-hmm. by Dr. Rudy Joseph Lombard, who was himself a Renaissance man. In my in my mind, he was the Harry Belafonte, mm-hmm. Sidney Poitier of <laughs> Black food ways, right? Um, just yes, indeed. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. And in the 1970s, um, he you know, published uh, this book well, along with Nathaniel Burton of these 15 black master chefs in New Orleans. And if we wouldn't have that book today, we wouldn't know who were the uh, master chefs of that time period. Um, and it's just, it's a treasured book. And he had, he, stu- he did so much for the city of New Orleans. I mean, I could go on and on. You all can look, mm. up, look them up later. Lombard versus Louisiana, the Supreme Court decision that integrated the lunch counters in New Orleans. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, what else can I say? You know, Lino, mm-hmm. take it, take it, take it from me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we, there's this, there's this, there's this, um, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to frame something with, with, with this, with this book being, uh, Nathaniel Burton, sitting in the front, you know, the very first image you encounter with this book is Nathaniel Burton in the cover. Mm-hmm. And immediately you, you're, you're thinking, wow, um, for me at least, I was just like, I've never seen a chef that looked like me, that looked like him, that looked mm-hmm. like this. Mm-hmm. You know, it just, it's, if that doesn't grab your attention, I don't know what else will. And as you start to look into that, you start to, you're diving deep into something so unique to American foodways and Creole cuisine in general that is just not been explored before. And as you said before, this is, this is a book that came out in 19, you know, 19, uh, in the 1970s Mm -hmm. at a time where there was one no, you know, there was, this is probably the first book written written by um by black chef that was focused in the ways of uh you know with the recipes and the stories that are coming from our perspective Mm -hmm. i don't think there was anything like that before and Mm -hmm. for others that might not know as well this book was edited by the great you know um you know the great i'll say i'll let you say the name of the person that edited the book tony morrison i mean there you go What's Toni Morrison? And, and I, I, I always, I can't wait for your documentary to come out because you shared with me a clip that you found of the moment that mm. uh, Toni mm. Morrison came to New Orleans to visit Rudy Lombard. And there he is, his fine self back in the day. <laughs> 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 with this, with a beautiful smile, just waiting and, you know, hugging Toni Morrison to invite her into this, you know, this Creole feast. And I remember, just, you know, just a side note, just talking to him about why he wrote that book when he was alive, you know, and just he wanted to lift these stories up and you are doing something similar in the 21st century and lifting this story up again. Could you talk a little bit just about, you know, the documentary process and of course your um, Black Chef series? Yeah. Um, so with the film, and it's inspiration from the book. We are, you know, you fast forward to now and some things have changed. Well, a lot has changed. And in in some good ways and in some bad ways, meaning some things just didn't change at all and they should have. And one of that is, you know, when many people come to this city, this great city, one of the things that's that seems to be a mystery for 
you know, for strange reasons, is not knowing who's behind the kitchens and who's cooking and behind all these kitchens and great restaurants in this city. That was the case then, and in some ways, that's still the case today. Um, this film kind of invites audiences to meet this unheralded Black chefs of New Orleans. It's kind of an intimate, intergenerational portrait that reframes acceptable culinary, you know, the, the acceptable culinary uh, histories and explores these indigenous, uh, these ingenious contributions of Black cooks who brought traditional food ways from West Africa to the New World and who continue to shape this iconic and uh, enduring uh, Creole cuisine. You know, Creole Feast follows all this new, this chefs, line cooks, and back of house workers as they balance the, um, the balance honoring the traditions of their elders and charting a new path for Creole cooking. Mm -hmm. You know, and some part of that, while I was researching, I discovered I just couldn't find as many photographs as you might think. Because I come and you come and I so we start talking about the story. Okay, you know about the book. Someone knows that you know they've never read this book before, and their perception of what the history of this you know the, the history of the food waste in this city you know it differs in many ways. And so I found it a lot. I found it. I found a. I found a lot of walls trying to find just some visual representation of who these mm. people were, you know, and what that time was. And what you will find is some of the photos in the book. And you start to ask yourself, and maybe one of that became a task with some, you know, some of the, you know, friends I've been working with. One of my best friends who's from New Orleans, Josh Barrier, who's, who we had, a, we had this conversation of, um, you know, this is great talking to these people while we're making this film. I'm getting to meet all these, you know, all these great folks in the city and chefs, and we're talking about their talents and they're reflecting on their experiences and history. And you start to feel like, well, you know, just this conversation itself, there's something historic about it. Now, mm -hmm. I guess say I fail at making this film a reality. Mm -hmm. It seemed really important and much easier to maybe start to take some photographs of these, of these people while we're doing this. How can we take some portraits? And so when you say this name, there is a face that goes with it. Mm -hmm. To not allow anyone to start to imagine that this isn't real, this isn't real people, and these stories are kind of made up. And to approach some of these things from the journalistic perspective is Yes, you're recording it. Yes, you have the video part and you have the audio part. But man, to have the photo is a different thing on its own. And I was, yeah, yeah I was just like, yeah, if I fail, I, I, if I completely fall to the ground and I'm not able to complete this uh, because I'm also a tourist, and there's a danger <laughs> to that. <laughs> you know? oh. so. I was just like, you know. I'm going to make sure you finish it. <laughs> I'm going exactly. to encourage you every day. Well, you have a whole community that's behind you to make sure that you finish it. <laughs> exactly. So you say you, know, you might need some Capricorn energy to take some photos, you know, and <laughs> because they might actually get some shit done. And <laughs> so, uh -huh. so he, we gathered at first, this was in 2017, uh, I believe, 2017. It wasn't 2017, it was 2019, because we started this project in 2017. Okay. Uh, we said we were going to gather as many Black chefs as possible and bring them up, uh, show up at Congo Square mm -hmm. and take a few photos and see what, you know, just to document mm -hmm. and archive archive really being the most important part of the whole process mm -hmm. um, to build this archive really because one of the things I really discovered and that wasn't we weren't really thinking about that then but we realized it after because we had a good amount of chefs that showed up and took some photos and it felt great and mm -hmm. some of some of these people had never really met each other or well they've met each other they've met before but they've never really been able to 
just talk because they pass each other for the past 10, 20 years in the quarters, just in the morning, 6, 7 a.m. You say hi to this other chef you've seen because, you know, you got the uniform and the hat. He's got the uniform and the hat. It's like, hey, and you saw you've been seeing each other for 20 years or so, but never really, really had the time to have a conversation because you're, you know, you're going to work. And as we know, chefs, uh, you know, once you leave home and you're getting close to work, you got a lot of stuff to do. And so they were all having these conversations and talking and really catching up. And that felt really beautiful as one part of it. And so fast forward again, post pandemic, we decided to try that again. And that really leaned more heavily on the idea of, you know, archiving even more aggressively because when we shot what we did in 2019, about three or four of the chefs all passed away by by the time we were trying to do the second one, the third one. Mm. And so you start to say, okay, this is, this is really, really important. And uh, this, it's, it's, it's built itself up to be just a, a part of the project in a very different way. And um, I'm very happy about um, what we've been able to put together so far and for all the great and beautiful uh, artists and chefs and all be, you know involved that have come together to make that possible, and we hope to continue doing that if we can, you know, every year or every other year or so going forward. Could you give us just a preview of some of the chefs that you highlighted, maybe a few of their stories? Of course. Um, hmm. uh, well, we talk about the great Nathaniel Burton and. Uh, I think of him as the godfather of Creole cooking. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is someone that was, um, a, you know, he was the executive chef at Bruce Arts and a few other places. Uh, I would say for folks to go and look into him and specifically read into the book to go deeper into his background. But he had, he comes into this, 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 he's just this, uh, this, I don't, you know, how to paint someone like Nathaniel Burton is someone that really breaks down what the skills are for you to be a great executive chef, mm -hmm. you know, for you to do the numbers of running about 4,000 people or so a day, for you to train a chef to understand every piece of meat by just looking at it, you can pick a piece, a piece of chuck, a piece of chuck and be able to know exactly where, you know, what part of the cow it came from. You know, to be able to use every instrument and, you know, all the tools, and I say instruments just because that comes on to a general word when you start talking about black chefs in New Orleans. It plays really well into how they are able to be just as close to and just as close to 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 the practice of jazz musicians. So good at what they do in a way That's that a great analogy. Right. In a way that is just it's 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 magical, but it's it's uh it allows me to take two three steps back into some of the greats like um you know the great uh you know chef Lita uh, richards i'll say i'm probably butchering the name because in new orleans when you say richard and everything it gets real specific over right. here so it could be richards or richard it, exactly <laughs> so anyone forgive me back there if it's just, you know <laughs> They're concerned about how I'm pronouncing some of his names, but mm -hmm. you know that goes to someone that like which, who 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 had one of the, the first. Uh, this is before um, Julia Childs. You think of Julia Childs, Lena Richards comes before before her, and that she had a first TV show, um, mm -hmm. and was a great caterer and had the book, uh, New Orleans, um, uh, the New Orleans cookbook, which I think if you are local or beyond, you should find a copy of that as well. And you go into folks like, yeah, Chef Leah Chase, which we had the honor of, I had the great honor of speaking to and, and interviewing for the project before she, before she passed away. And, I like to talk about, uh, I'm highlighting a lot of the women primarily and because for obvious reasons, because 
much of why I got into this was inspired by, you know, my mother, who is an amazing cook. And I grew up with her stories and, and her cooking. And much of all the male chefs I've spoken to, they all attribute their inspirations from their mothers in some shape or form. And so as you start to go back, you start to see this lineage of women that came before all the way back to, you know, to Gory Island, where the slaves left my country, to, you know, the ports here of New Orleans. And we talk about the black hand in the pot. Okay. And I had a great time in one of the kitchens, which is not around anymore. And that's the Bonton, Bonton Cafe. And mm. there was, in there was Dot Hall, you know, the head chef. And there was uh, Willa, uh, Willina Benjamin and Joyce Owens. Mm. And I swear to you in that space, it felt like you're in this TV show that these women have all been in that place and they've been working there for over 40 years, mm. close together and and uh, and just exchanging stories and going on and on and and creating and just there's this joy in the room and doing what they love to do and what they've been doing for so long. Hmm. And it's a beautiful thing to experience because uh, again, once you sit in front of sit in these restaurants and you're getting all this food, it's really it's 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 I think it's in some ways it's a service for you to ask yourself who made this food. I think we live in a time where um, things have become so automated that the idea of a real human being making your food seems like a foreign concept. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, I'm not the most religious person, but there was a time where when you were, you, you know, you sit down to eat you know, the first thing you did was a prayer and some part of a prayer always was to thank the person, to thank the folks that made the food. Maybe somehow along the way we've, you know, we've shifted away from, from religion, which I can understand. But there was something really special about you taking a moment to thank the person that made the food because in that moment you are thinking about the person that made the food. And we don't do that as much anymore. I find myself thinking about that and that I, I find myself not thinking about that more often than, than before. Um, because we've gone away from eating on Sundays with our families to eating alone at home from some food that was delivered by Uber. And, and uh, you know, yeah, I think that's, 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 as we do that, we should do some more work to, yeah, to look into the people that make our food. Because that's really what this is about. It's about shedding light on, you know, the great chefs, not just in New Orleans, but, you know, in the Carolinas, in New York, in mm -hmm. Oakland, and other places far and beyond. So. Ooh, this is a powerful first half of the um, episode, and I just want to <laughs> thank you all. I want to thank you all for listening thus far, and we will be, be right back after a word from our sponsors, and we're going to talk with Lino Asana a little bit more about um, Creole cuisine in New Orleans, his roots in the Cameroon, and how that's connected to New Orleans, and the um, character of um, well, his film, Chef Lazone, as well. Uh, so we'll be right back after these brief messages. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. There's a reason when you think of Wisconsin, you think cheese. Cheese is a huge part of Wisconsin's history and future. In Wisconsin, the state of cheese... The tradition of cheesemaking excellence began 180 years ago, before Wisconsin was recognized as a state. Immigrants traveled to settle in this lush, green hills of Wisconsin, bringing their cheesemaking traditions with them. These storied skills combined with the freshest milk available created a cheesemaking culture that is uniquely Wisconsin. 
Wisconsin's 1,200 cheesemakers, many of whom are third and fourth generation, continue to pass on old world traditions while adopting modern innovations in cheesemaking craftsmanship. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. So tell me a little bit, uh, you know, you were briefly talking just about how, um, you know, how we are kind of disconnected from uh, our table, from the, you know, from saying blessings and the rituals and traditions that historically have been, brought us together in communities throughout the generations, throughout the decades. And it's something also that we brought with us in, when we were enslaved to, like you said, the ports of New Orleans and that idea of um, Lanyap, that idea of Southern hospitality is really rooted in, you know, West African and Central African principles of, you know, of community. So I'm just curious, you know, what are some of the, um, you know, your observations, just you as a Cameroonian looking at Creole cuisine and why is it so important um, and why is it so integral to American cuisine? Hmm. Um, I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, you know, what is American cuisine? And uh, the great uh, Dr. Je Jessica Harris have pointed or created or written a good a great deal about us finding some connections and identities of where this food comes from, from the black, from, from this perspective that we're talking about and more. But to me, one of the questions, one, that was the main question for me is really, what is American food? Um, mm. Because if we're talking about burgers, if we're talking about lasagna, we're talking about, um, you know, burritos, you know, what are we talking about? And is American. Creole cuisine American? Is that is that's you know is it is it American? <laughs> I think that's I think that is the answer to it. Is that what is the original? What can we really claim to be something that is uniquely ours in mm -hmm. in the sense that we're so good at remix? We do a really mm -hmm. good job at remixing foods and taking other foods and making them better. Creole food kind of falls to me as like. As, like you said, like for me, Cameroonian food is Cameroonian food in so many ways and so many specific things that there's probably, I'd say, 60% of the food that you won't find anywhere else in the world, maybe more, right? That's uniquely just that cuisine itself. And so coming from a perspective and identity where your food identity is so specific and so solid in that way. And as I came here as a, and, and when I was, I, I got here when I was 15. And so I'm eating all this. I'm, you know, I'm eating this and I'm trying eating pizzas, which took me a while. Eating a burger took me a while. Eating, um, you know, some of the foods now from some of my, uh, my black friends. And that I was meeting later, later, um, I start to eat, you know, um, some greens here, some mac and cheese here, some, uh, you know, the least can go, the list goes on, but you start to find, I start to find some, some similarities and connections, but it's not till I got to New Orleans and then you try some Creole red beans and rice, which is very similar to our black beans and rice. Mm. and cooked almost exactly the same way, which is weird. You know, it's very weird to me. I never encountered that before. And you have your gumbo, you have your jambalaya, which is like our jalos, and then you have your beignets. That's just like our puff puff or, you know. So you start to, the connection is, as you are from a California per perspective, from a Cameroon perspective, ca California perspective, and you're shifting closer and closer, and you get into the South and you're getting to New Orleans and you start to taste these things that are closer. It's like this circle is connected at the other end of it. And you're, you're starting to see this, like, this, like, this, like path that is just 
connected directly right to your heart to where you came from mm -hmm. by just eating the food, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so to me, American food is Creole food. American food is, you know, barbecue. American food is some of the great dishes you'll find in the, you know, Gullah uh, uh parts of the Carolinas. Mm -hmm. You know, beyond that, I don't know what the hell is American food beyond those three things and a few others, but that to me is, um, that's where, you know, that's where, that's where it seems like our folks have been able to really stand solid and say, this is, this is where, this is where we will express ourselves, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with, with what we know and what is, you know, what we can maybe, um, uh, explain or break down, but it's just inherently like a thing that is, is, you know, is glued to you like, um, it's like a callus over your, your heart in terms of your, in terms of the, in terms of your culinary identity, you know, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's kind of what I think. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. No, absolutely. And I'm, you know, I want to, talk also about uh chef lazone you know a retired mm -hmm. chef mm -hmm. uh in new orleans i mean he is a character <laughs> he is <laughs> you know and you've developed a beautiful relationship with him and it was beautiful to watch you all together when you invited me to a recent event that you hosted um yeah. but i'm just curious you know just some of the things that he you know, shared with you about mm. just the contemporary state mm. of Creole cuisine. And, mm. you know, he, mm. I remember he served this incredible gumbo, you know, mm. and I haven't tasted a gumbo like that in a long time. And I'm mm. just curious, some of the, you know, th your thoughts after every time you leave him, you know, what do you take away you know, and who is he? Chef Lazon, for those who don't know who Chef Lazon, because we have many chefs like mm. that in New Orleans, mm. our elders who are retired, who are walking mm -hmm. encyclopedias of recipes. And I always think about um, one uh, person in particular, Chef Stanley. Uh, he was in the Creole feast, and it always broke my heart that I didn't, I wasn't able to, um, mm -hmm. you know, film him and document him in time for his death. But he won, you know, he was in the Culinary Olympics. He was mm -hmm. the head chef mm -hmm. at, you know, the Hilton Riverside. And there were so many like that. So what you're doing now is so important in archiving just this generation before we lose them, you know. So talk to us about Chef Lazone. And um, Chef Lazone is, I don't usually would, I don't think it's fair to ever compare anyone because I think each person is is very unique to who they are. Mm -hmm. But we started talking about Nathaniel Burton and how when you think of an executive chef, what does that mean? What does that look like? And and I think another person that embodies that really well is uh is Chef uh uh, Lazone Randolph. Mm -hmm. And, and the trip, of, I mean, he's just someone you want to put a cowboy hat on and, <laughs> and, 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 and put a camera on him and, <laughs> and give him, you know, and just let him put roll. him, just let him, just roll. Let him <laughs> roll. And I swear, you know, put some pots, <laughs> put some pots. You know, have yes, some fire do. somewhere, and and a, and and a bunch of and just a bunch of people, and yeah. you know, it's and he will tell you everything you're doing wrong. He <laughs> tell you everything you're doing wrong. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that's that's who. That's yeah. If there was a great like um, uh, Duong's like cooking show, you know, mm -hmm. man, yeah, the things he would say to 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 what people think of each dish and what they're doing and how much and how we're all, you know, how many people are failing and what they think Creole cooking is mm. and what cooking in general is and how, you know, uh, uh, Chef Lazone was the executive chef for Brennan's 
and um, he came under Mike Roussel, which is another great uh, black chef. Uh, and like all of them, they walked their way up from dishwasher, learned each station. And when the time came, when Mike Roussel was leaving, and one of the things I admire about um, Lazone is he's got the bravado of like 10 people and mm -hmm. the confidence of, you know, he's just got a great deal of uh, confidence that's packed into him, in, you know, just packed, packed up into his, uh, you know, into his character. Mm -hmm. And then the question that I'm asking the zone is, okay, Mike Roussel left. And at this time, mind you, Mike Roussel is probably the only black executive chef uh, black, uh, like the the only Creole uh, executive chef in New Orleans at that time, mm -hmm. and there goes this six foot, you know, dark skin, you know, chef, which I think at that time he was in his thirties, early thirties or late twenties, and I was saying, did they consider you being to become the executive chef? And he was like, well, if they weren't thinking about me. I'm leaving. I was going to be gone if I wasn't going to become the executive chef. You know, he's saying I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I didn't go asking for the job. Mm. You know, it doesn't work that way. He has a great deal of respect for Mike Roussel. But the idea of it not going to him and going to someone else, which happened sometimes because some of these institutions would bring in some other chef from out of state, he was saying that was not going to happen. And this is someone that speaks with that kind of confidence you can tell how he speaks on it. That's just how he was then. This is still how he is now. Meaning I deserve it. I've worked hard. I've worked hell and hard for it. And if you're not going to give it to me, then I'm out. You know, mm -hmm. that's the kind of personality that he, that's the kind of person he is. He's someone that's going to, you're just not going to, you're just not going to ride over him. And that goes into how he, you know, his uh, his ethos and how he he works and how he approaches the food, he loves it and you know he can pick up all the books and go right deep into it, learning as many new things as he can. That's how they all were at that time. Just the excitement and interest of of because you had a time we had all these French chefs that were popping into New Orleans, and they were all looking this way with the French flag, you know, next to their neck with the, you know, wrapping their, you know, the handkerchief, the handkerchief on there, you know, there was this, there's this like swag that has appeared into, into the city at that time. And I think some part of many of them wanted to be just as great as some of these French chefs in terms of technique. Mm -hmm. And they opened themselves up to learning and, and to learn meant you're, you're dealing with 12 hour days. But one of the biggest things I'll say, you know, uh, Chef Lazone has left, or, or, or one of the things he said to me that really resonated with me is he made this statement that the once upon a time, there was just no ACs in this kitchen. Mm. And so it wasn't cool to be a chef as it is now until they put ACs in the kitchens. Mm. Mm. And so if you for all thinking about that for a second, it's like New Orleans is very, very, very hot. Mm -hmm. And for a while, all the chefs in the kitchen were dealing with heat, no AC. Well, now you got TV shows. You got all these people wearing the poopy white, you know, you know, vests and they're doing all this and doing all that. And the idea of a celebrity chef is this and, you know, Think back to what a kitchen was at that time. No AC. You're making the souffles that are how many, you know, how many degrees, super hot, burning yourself. There's heat everywhere. And considering that the, the kitchen was predominantly African-American. Exactly. exactly. That's, that's exactly it, what he's trying to say is that it's, you know, it wasn't cool for you to be a chef until they put some, until, until they put some ACs in there. Then you all mm -hmm. of a sudden, you say, oh, this is a cool job to have. Maybe I can do this. And everyone starts flocking over there. 
the pay the pay increases and you know um a lot changed in terms of who's back there who's in the front mm-hmm. and who's the executive chef and who are the cooks oh now you got black cooks and executive chefs that are white and then they get to parade in the front and 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 claim and state that these are the dishes, these are the things we're doing. And not to say there weren't some black, some great white chefs. There were. Mm-hmm. It's a really difficult job, despite your race. I'll say that, you know. Um, but what we're talking and exploring when we're talking about these people and these chefs is recognition. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, but yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. What you were saying? No, something. no, 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 no. I was just saying, you know, just to support your point. I remember. I think I told you that I was talking to Don Hubbard, one of our elders, who, um, you know, has a um, a beautiful hotel, man, you know, um, Airbnb, not just Airbnb, but it, you know, it's a it's a beautiful home where on St. Charles and yeah. his pa ran, as we call it, say in New Orleans, you know, is Godfather. His pa ran is actually in. Um, you know, Creole face. And he was talking about how Mm. he would have to, you know, wearing that chef suit um, also was in some ways kept you protected from the police. And, you know, when he would have to go um, work, you know, as an executive chef, uh, you know, he would, he wouldn't get harassed because we have to remember that some, it wasn't, uh, you know, up, uptown New Orleans was not a friendly place, um, you know, Mm-mm. up until the seventies. And so, Mm-mm. you know, um, and how he had trained some of these top chefs, these top white chefs, uh, and hoping that he could get an executive chef position, but he never did, you know, mm-hmm. um, but he was the executive chef in so many ways, you know, he mm-hmm. was the executive chef, but it, they never publicized it. So mm-hmm. now, you know, what are your thoughts about just black chefs, young black chefs in New Orleans? And, you know, is Creole cuisine that, that, is it dying? Is it a lost art? Do you see any chefs that are, you know, kind of taking the, the, the rain back to say, no, this is our food. We need to, you know, continue to put out the recipes that our elders put out. Yeah, um, we an attempt of what you attended um, was the dinner where we were putting together, you know, some young chefs next to some, you know, some OG chefs like Lazon. Mm-hmm. And even during the process of taking some of his photos, portraits, you find a good amount of the young chefs show up and. Some of some that just graduated. It's strange because the times we've done it was well, not strange. The times we've done it, there's been at least two, three chefs that showed up that just graduated that week from culinary school. Mm-hmm. And I'm always interested in what do they look like? Where would they be 10, 20 years from now? Because it's mm-hmm. like they it's like they're showing up when that's like you seen a photo of Nathaniel Burry on the day he graduated culinary school, which he never did go, but is uh, is an example of that. My, what I've noticed while talking to the many, you know, chefs here, young and old, is, is that it's just in the love of it, the love of the food is there because the identity is so strong. I don't see Creole cuisine going anywhere necessarily Mm -hmm. what my what the unfortunate part that i think we 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 could lose is is there is there is some things to technique of you have someone like lazone you have someone like you know chef uh 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 you know chef chef you know, Dot Hall or, you know, like the chef Leah, Leah Chase and all this, all this great chefs before and some still around. 
there is some level of technique because you've been doing and cooking these dishes for, you know, 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's, it's the elder thing, right? In, in my culture, it's, you know, it's like that thing where, um, you know, when, once we lose one elder, that's like a library that's just burnt to the ground mm -hmm. in a way. What I find missing is if you look in the book Creole Feast and you look at some of the other books, what you see there is a great deal of technique. That is a part of Creole cooking inherently, but what we, what some of the young chefs know from cooking at home and what they learn from some of the culinary schools they go to is to me just 40% of what the food actually represents and what it actually is because there are some things that are just, you know, um, just recipes and things that are just disappearing. And you can read the recipes, but the techniques are strange and different because chefs, it's specifically black chefs, don't, um, we, we just, they don't focus too much on breaking down recipes in the ways that, um, that you can say, okay, I'll copy that, I'll do it exactly as you, because they can write that recipe and do it four different ways. What you're trying to learn when you sit and stand, when you stand next to them, like Lazone and some of the young chefs did in, the, in, in, uh, in November when we had the dinner, is you see them do these things in so many different ways that are not written in any books. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we might miss and what that, that's my, that, that's, that's, I went to a restaurant in New Orleans, I won't say the name, where another chef of one of my great friends, uh, 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 Chef Serene, mm -hmm. which we both know. And we were talking about the menu of this place that has been around for, you know, since, you know, for a while, for a very, very long time, in a way that defines parts of what this food and cuisine and city is. Now you would think that this is a place that will protect and keep some of these ingredients, some of these recipes and, and, and processes intact. But what we had and what you might have, what you might have had four years ago at this place and what is being given to you from a chef's perspective, they can tell three, four steps were skipped. Mm. Right. You're making this dish one way the right way four years ago. And out of a sudden, you've decided to, f to skip a bunch of steps. And some parts of that problem is the new chefs don't know how to make it the way it was made four years ago. That's not a long time. And that's mm. unfortunate that it's starting to look like it's leaning that way where this thing, this, this, uh, you know, some of this, 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 this dishes that we eat and enjoy and love might change just because some of the chefs and some of some of the younger chefs are one not interested not as interested in being chefs as they used to be or the you know the process of doing it is 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 just for some reason that they they seem to justify as just it, it you know they can't keep it up they can't train there's no one to train them to make this food the way it used to be some of the chefs have retired and some have passed on and uh i think that is the real issue that we you know are all facing in the city that might not be very loud as of now but it just might be later because there is foods we eat at home that you feel like, oh, well, that's not going to change. And that's true. But there's so many more that are on the menus of some of the restaurants you really love that just might change because, well, you know, there's no one to train them to make them the way they used to make them. That's unfortunate. Yeah, it's really unfortunate. And I think that, you know, post-Katrina, you know, it had a lot um, – the – the faces, the the people who were being hired in the kitchen changed, you know. Um, mm -hmm. and so you have chefs from other cities who don't have that Creole repertoire. And then also, you know, the more, the further we, you know, Americanize, you know, and 
you know, the, the younger generation get used to processed cheese or, you know, or fast food or Walmart. The, and the further people get away from cooking a lot of those, you know, classic Creole dishes, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. there is no food memory, you know? That is, you know, that's an important factor um, for all of us, even if you're not from New Orleans, just the idea of your food memory. Mm-hmm. Um, and my recent trip, I got to go to, you know, to parts of revisiting some of the places, the home I was raised in and my grandmother's place. And one of the things that struck out to me is my grandmother's kitchen, which is the kitchens in the village and the kitchens at home are very different. And the kitchen in the village is, you know, three stone fireside with a cast iron pot on top. But there's this thing I had forgotten, which was there was a there's a there's a sort of like a little cage made out of uh, of um, of bamboo sticks, and it's used to smoke the fish, mm-hmm. and they keep spices. And but it's probably it's predominantly known to smoke fish and sometimes to dry the corn that was har- harvested. And you've seen all these techniques and these this things. And I was talking to a friend of mine about what his memory was here in New Orleans. And what, does it, what did his pantry look like? Because these ideas of what a kitchen looks like to us and what the kitchen looks like to us now, like our kitchen and what does our parents' kitchen look like at that time? And you start to find these things about it that, um, that is, that is beautiful, but also they are, you know, heartbreaking in terms of what you're doing and what they were doing and how things have changed in one of the ways. But to even go back, one of the things you mentioned, which I want to bring out too, is just the labor part of what it, what it means to, you know, to be a chef with, with that New Orleans is, you know, it's got one of the lowest minimum wages in the whole nation Mm -hmm. and with any real issue in any place if you start to pay attention to the money a lot of things start to become very clear Mm -hmm. and so if we're not seeing a lot of black chefs and black cooks and whatnot in you know in the service industry as well the pay is too goddamn low and it's not it's not sustainable and one thing that beats me is, okay, you have some of these institutions and that have been around for so long and you've made millions and millions of dollars. I'm sure you have because you've been around for so long. And I know it's hard to run a restaurant in, you know, business. Um, but I don't think it's that hard it's to pay people living wages. That just Absolutely. beats me. And it's the most heartbreaking part to this whole thing is, is to exploit, is to exploit people in a way when it comes to some, to come, when it comes to an industry that is so, so, so intimate Mm -hmm. in that you that own the business are so connected to these people, or at least you pretend that you are. Absolutely. And, the, and the people that are eating the food are so connected to the people making it, or that's what it seems like it is, you know, and, and, you know, what, what I talk with one of the chefs, um, another great chef here in the city, Chef Mil- Milton Prudence, who still works at, um, who's still around to, you know, still does, still, still, still cooking and, and at it. And he's, one of the things he is, he, he's really excited about is teaching, but also one of the things that breaks his heart is, is the idea that you would rather hire uh, a chef or cook from out of state than to send your, you know, some of your workers, you know, to some extended training because if you sent them to extended training, now you have to increase how much you pay them for. Mm-hmm. So you rather keep them where they are, you know, mm-hmm. and I get America is a capitalistic society, but 
you know, some of these things and some of these things when you when you meet some of these these chefs, there's one um another chef that we've I've got to to know over the years and that's you know, Chef Ernest uh you know, call him Skeeter, uh Jack Junior and he's one of the the executive associates at uh at Antoine's. Mm-hmm. It broke my heart when we first sat to sat down with Skeeter because his voice was so low, mm. so low, many because of the reasons that he's been yelled at so much over time that his voice just sunk down that low. Mm. And it's not to say this is a grown, grown, grown elder that is in his eighties. It's not that it wasn't there. It could be for many reasons of it just being a very emotional day for him because one of the things he said to me as far as long as i've been doing this which is you know 40 years he started when he was 16 years old no one has ever sat him down and say hey how did you get here what Mm. did you you know no one has ever asked him that no one ever put a camera in his face and said hey not that you need to but he's been back in that place for that long. He's someone that should have been an, an executive chef. But yeah. it's suiting and it fits an institution to keep him as an executive associate. Yeah. Why the executive part? Oh, here's another title that I'm going to slap on there to make you sound and feel good about what you're doing. But you're doing the same damn job. You're getting paid the same amount that was paying you 10 years ago or so. Mm. Now, a lot has changed. I would note a years later, two, three years later, I meet, I meet Ernest again and his mood has changed. He's, 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 he's more confident. He's speaking a little loud, he's a little taller. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they had in- increased his pay. Mm-hmm. You know, they had, uh, you know, I don't think they had changed the title, but something changed in him when I saw him. Mm. And I asked him why, and I, and he said it could be that the executive chef that was there left, but it also it also could be that we came and spoke to him, and then they were like, okay, maybe we need to start paying more attention to you. Mm. Mm. Forty That's years powerful. later, it it takes it takes. It takes someone to show up there for you to recognize. But all, all that's just all, you know, all to say, like, yeah, the labor part of this industry is very difficult, yes, for the people running it, because we are our friends. That yeah. uh, it's difficult. It's, it's, it's difficult to balance because the younger chefs today, they don't want to do five years in your kitchen as they used to. They're very interested in starting and expressing themselves and finding their own thing, Mm -hmm. you know? And Mm -hmm. so you have to get real comfortable about the idea that they might just be there for a couple months or a year, can Mm -hmm. penalize them for wanting so much more for themselves. And no, you can't, you know, so it's changing and in, in, in a good way, I think. Mm-hmm. Just for the fact that they are more bold and and curious about their identities and they know they cannot explore those things inside the space of another institution. They rather start their own pop up, say, hey, this is a food I want to make. This is a food my grandmother used to make. This yeah. is a food that I'm thinking about mixing with this other food because that's part of Creole food. I had an interesting conversation with Chef Zo- uh, uh, the grand, great uh, great granddaughter of Leah Chase, uh, Chef Zoe. We Can wonder- I just say that I'm just so excited for their? Um, they just released their latest, um, you know, uh, show uh, yes. Last Legacy on PBS, yes. and yes. So I was there for the launch and to, mm-hmm. and to at WYES and to see them making the dishes that they were making and the personality mm. and the generations mm. on the screen. It's going to be a game changer. And I'm just so excited to see that. But to see that happen, to see Doug, Zoe, to see yeah. Eve, you know, yeah. um, it, Cleo, you know, Aunt Cleo, I'm, I'm so excited mm-hmm. to see the Chase family because they are going, when I tell you this, they are going to be a national phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm so excited. 
I'm so excited for that as well. It's just this, um, it's, Zoe's, Zoe, uh, Zoe's got this sparkling, like sharp, uh, excitement mm-hmm. and curiosity about mm-hmm. the food. And that's kind of what we were, it's, it's, it's great when, it's great to just see this, this new energy and this generational perspective of what the cuisine re- represents. And that's one of the things I'm excited about the show. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, again, it's putting a huge spotlight in, in, you know, on what we're talking about, which is Creole food, but, but also to just the, you know, the history and the story and, uh, and what it means and breaking some of the misconceptions others might have. Um, because I think to see, to really see something is to, is difficult for you to ignore it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think what that show, you know, will represent is that, no, you can't, you can't, you can't ignore, or you can't be ignorant about what the food represents and who the people who have been a great part of it represents as well, you know, so I'm excited. Absolutely. And to see Duke and Zoe in the kitchen together on the first episode mm, and then making yeah. dirty rice yeah. and uh, Creole chicken and, and, you know, just some of the techniques that you were talking about earlier that mm-hmm. are not in cookbooks to see oh. that on, on screen was profound. You know, it, it made me tear up because, you know, both of us knew Miss <laughs> Leah and to mm-hmm. like see her grandchildren you know, just take on what, you know, what Duck said, you know, his n- latest restaurant, Chapter 4, the fourth generation is so powerful. And I think it's going to really inspire other chefs, you know, and no matter where they take it, you know, if they decide, like you said, to open up a pop up, open up a restaurant, because we do see a rise in black restaurant ownership in the city for that simple reason, because they want their own. Or if they take it to another city, we see a lot of chefs, you know, move. I, I can remember talking to somebody about, um, how the Atlanta scene changed after Katrina, the restaurant scene mm. changed and the food got better. And, they, mm. and somebody told me they believe because New Orleans chefs moved to Atlanta and brought that, you know, flavor with them. Right. So, yeah. you know, it's just, it's just, it's, it's, in, it's an interesting time, you know, and I'm glad that you're able to document this and, you know, and yeah. for it to be a, a living, a living archive. Yeah. The, um, uh the to add on quickly to the to one of the things that um one of the things Leah would say uh, chef, uh Leah would say is is uh food builds big bridges mm. and I find that what they're doing is doing that I find that in so many of the ways that uh some of the young chefs are exploring you know, themselves and, and the food, because Chef Zoe was saying, we were, we were, we were kind of laughing at her, you know, their, their, her uh, aspiration of the idea of opening a Creole food in Italy. Mm. And, and, and how weird that is, that mm-hmm. part of the food that or the places, some of the foods that are the identities of Creole food, whether that is French. So you can be on the south side, you know, the southern parts of France and it's have easy. Creole food, you know, it just have yeah. Creole food in those places. And, and, uh, I find that to be beautiful, but that's where, you know, that's where her mind is going. Is this like, let's just, you know, Back, you know, back to where it, you know, it, it, you know, some of the inspirations come from, and and beyond. One of the things that I like to point out too, if you, if you, in terms of the bridges, in terms of the food expand, expanding out, is when people go and Google, I uh, invite people to Google this. If you Google, uh, you know, chicken lazone, mm-hmm. you know, that was recently brought to the attention of Chef Lazone that he created that. And it's been on the internet for a while, for a very long time. And that is his recipe that just popped out into the internet, into the abyss, into this universe, and is floating around. And it's got his last name to it and will be around way beyond. And that is 
this strange rendition of Creole food just extending itself again out into 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 the space. But you know, it's uh, it's funny when the many people who've cooked that dish might not have known where it came from, mm. and and you know, but I, but for the few that might have, it's it's still a beautiful thing. And even if they didn't, it does not matter. It's just that that's 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 what that's what I think Chef Leo uh, was talking about is that you know food you know builds bridges. You know, uh, she would add on to say, I don't care if you're the Pope, you're the Prince, you know, mm. you got to eat. And if I mm. can feed you, then I got a job. Right. And, you know, uh, so, yeah. My exciting time. It yeah. is exciting times. My last question, just, you know, you thinking about your identity and place in New Orleans and just your own upbringing in the Cameroon and, you know, living in California, like you said, um, you know, there's always this saying that New Orleans is the most African city in the U S <laughs> yeah, does indeed. that remain the same? Is that still the same today? I'm just curious. Mm. What, are, mm. and what makes it the most African city? If mm. you mm-hmm. mm. um, I think it's, you know, it's that smell when the rain falls and mm-hmm. it hits the dust and you, you get this whiff of this, this smell and it's so unique and specific. And it's, um, I think, I think there's this visceral feeling you get that you cannot explain. And I think Sometimes to me, um, the the mysterious things about anything for me, you know, is is it leans towards like smell. Smell is just a mysterious thing, and I use smell to say New Orleans smells like Africa or smells like my country, Cameroon, as opposed to all the other things that are very clear. It's just because it, that idea of it, smell is the most mysterious part of it. But to demystify the whole thing, it leans really well to what the culture represents, um, what culture means, and what community means to New Orleans. And um, I think it's the one place where post-pandemic or pre-pandemic or whatever, I was trying to decide you know, where is my spirit going to feel very calm enough mm-hmm. for me to focus on my purpose? And it's loud in every other place. As a filmmaker, you're, you're from, you know, that lives in Oakland, everything yells, well, you got to go to LA, you know? Mm-hmm. There's a difference. It's like your heart and your mind. And you have to face those two things. And so if you're really listening to your heart, it's like, you know, you start talking and leaning towards how does your spirit really feel? How would it feel in a place like L.A.? How would your spirit feel in a place like New York? Not that I got any problem in New York or any other places or Chicago, whatever. But I had really, I had a lot of ache for home because I had not been home since I was 15. Mm. And I couldn't really quite go back just yet because that was the year I had one more year to become an American citizen. And that's a whole nother story to go into about the reasons why I couldn't go back home at that time. Mm-hmm. And so the only place I could think of that made me feel like home, whether because of the food, which is you got your red beans and rice on Monday and you eat that and it's the same. And it takes me to this, to this place, which my spirit just becomes, you know, it you know it's it's walking on grass with your feet without your shoes on type of feeling you know mm. Mm. and so I feel that way in New Orleans I know I only feel that way back in my country Cameroon and and so it was just very obvious you know for the sake of your own sanity as the sake of your own spirit the sake of you keeping to do what you love to do so much, you know, it's without no doubt that this is the place that your heart just feels at home at. 
and mm. I can't explain it. I just can just say, yeah, it smells like home. It feels like it, and uh, I love it. And I've got I I got to go back home uh, last year, and that just um, you know the senses are just stronger. It's the same most, you know. I think that's what makes um, Dakar Nola's Juneteenth celebration last year at Ben Burkett, the uh, Mississippi mm. African American Farmers, um, you know, celebration so special. It's um, just you know the bridge between the continent, New Orleans, Mississippi. You know, everybody who was there, even had folks from the Carolinas there, and just to see us, you know, mm-hmm. in this space telling our stories, um, but definitely grounded in the, where we are and the legacy mm-hmm. of African-Americans in this country was profound, you know? It's, it's like our, it's the, it's the energy of, of the despite it all kind of energy. Despite this, despite that, we survive and we thrive and we celebrate and we, you know, we, you know we're gonna dance we're gonna dance on Sunday, and uh, you can, you can, you can try again or with your troubles or your bad energy or your attitude on Monday. But these are the people that will cleanse all that up by, you know, by Sunday. That's like the old, uh, you know, uh, Af- uh, 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 African um, uh, proverbs about. Uh, about the mosquito and the ear and how the mm. mosquito the mosquito really loves the ear and declares his love for the ear and the, and the ear laughs so hard and says, you know, look at you, you know, you look like a skeleton. How long you think you're gonna live? And <laughs> the mosquito walks away sad and disappointed. And that's why a mosquito always comes back to your ear to whisper, hey, you know, look at me, I'm still alive, you know, and, mm. uh, and we laugh, we laugh at this, uh, the, I think what I'm excited about with Juneteenth, the concept of just celebration is just, yeah, to celebrate because one of my approaches with the film in general had always been about just the idea of celebration. I'm not interested in some expose thing about this, about this and that and that. I'm interested in celebrating these people. I'm interested in celebrating us. And mm. that's, that's, there's, 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 there's a beautiful joy in centering our stories in that perspective. And, uh, and, um, because it's yeah, you know, it's got a feeling to it. Uh, I, I lean, I, I, I try my best to always lean that way when I can, when it comes to the work. Well, we thank you so much, Lino, so much for your work, uh, for everything that you're doing to document and tell these stories. Um, These stories need to be told. So we want to thank you for joining us on Culture and Flavor. We want to thank our listeners. You have uh, listened to Culture and Flavor with Zella Palmer with our special guest, Lino Asana. And we look forward to hearing more about your work. And we cannot wait until... Uh, the documentary and the film is out. And, you know, for more information about Lino Asana, where can they contact you? You can contact and look into the project on the Creole Feast, www.creolefeastlegacy.com. Uh, that's where we'll be keeping updates. And as we continue to, you know, do this work and, what is that is the archiving and the completion and completing the film. So, but that, thank you so much for having me speak on this and speak to you. This was great. Thank you, Lino. And I will see you Juneteenth. <laughs> I will see you Juneteenth. Don't bring your shoes. Keep that shit. No, 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 I'm not going to bring my shoes. I, I, we, we, we're going to be on the farm. Grow that We're going to be on the farm. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Thank you all for joining Culture and Flavor. We're out. Peace. Peace. Culture 
Culture and Flavor is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.